do you justify a strategy based on sabotage, blockades, etc., while upholding societies based on direct or true democracy? Do I see that as contradictory? Part of the problem that the world faces is that, as Lewis Mumford talked about, most of us don't resist the mega machine because we have bought into what he called the magnificent bride. That most of us will support the mega machine as it consumes the planet because we have access to ice cream 24 seven, we have access to hot showers, we have access to modern medicine, we have access to, we in the industrialized nations especially, have access to all sorts of goodies. And it's like Upton Sinclair said about how it's hard to make a man understand something when his job depends on not understanding it. It's hard to make people understand something when their entitlement depends on them not understanding it. So most people refuse to see the connections between this large consumer culture and the murder of the planet, industrial culture and the murder of the planet. And many of those who do see it would prefer this culture over life on a planet, even if it's all life on the planet, so that you can have, as we talked about before, the New York Times talking about the possibility of human extinction without mentioning the possibility of giving up on this way of life. So they won't give up with this way of life even when it causes human extinction. Somebody just sent me a, a link to a book in Germany called 2052, a global forecast for the next 40 years. And this person talks about how this culture is killing the planet and he has uh, some recommendations toward the end of the book as to what people should do. Number three is invest in high-end entertainment electronics as a substitute for reality. Four, do not educate your children to become nature lovers because then they will miss nature when it's gone. Six, visit the places of interest in this world before they are ruined. So when you have, that's a semi-environmentalist is saying that. So what do you think people from Forbes are going to say? That, look, there's a hard enough time convincing people, first, that global warming is really happening. And second, when they get convinced that global warming is happening, the solutions that they're aiming for are all about protecting industrial civilization. They're not about protecting the real planet. So what do you do? If you care more about the real planet, the real planet, who is being destroyed? Then, look, here's a way to say this. If you took a vote among only humans, and if you especially took a vote among only industrial humans as to whether they would prefer to um, continue to have retractable stadium roofs and all sorts of football games with 60,000 people attending every football game, or whether they would, uh, that hammerhead sharks continue to exist. I'm sorry, but football games would win. And this way of life would win. And on the other hand, if you took a vote all around the world, and hammerhead sharks got a vote, and so did pygmy sperm whales, and so did phytoplankton, whose populations are collapsing, if you took all of them to vote, then I think that they would vote for a living planet. And another part of this is if someone is not capable of making rational decisions or not capable of making reasonable decisions, you don't, you sometimes have to be a guardian for them. I don't know if I've mentioned before that there was a story I read when I was a young teen, I believe it was by Frederick Brown. It's about this man who, these friends, one of whom works on a nuclear program, building nuclear bombs, and his friend who is an anti-nuclear activist. And they have friendly conversations about it. And then the, the man who is working on the nuclear programs is a single father who has an 
adult child who was developmentally disabled, severely developmentally disabled. And one time, the anti-nuclear person, and this is a, non, this is a fiction story, don't worry. Um, at one point, the, the anti-nuclear activist is at his friend's house, and then he goes and says goodnight to the developmentally disabled son, and then he leaves. And a couple of minutes later, the pro-nuclear father walks into his son's room and he sees that the anti-nuclear activist gave his son a loaded gun to play with. And the last line of the story is the father thinking, what sort of madman would give a developmentally disabled adult a loaded gun to play with? And of course, the point of the story is that the pro-nuclear father didn't see the irony of that's exactly what he was doing, is creating loaded guns to give to a clearly, to a society clearly incapable of making the best reasonable choices. And let's cut through all the rhetoric. If you care about life on the planet, this culture has to be stopped. Every cell in my body wants for this to be done because we all have a great realization. We go, you know, this is a really terrible idea. We need to stop it. If we had the numbers, we could shut it down in a heartbeat. But we don't have those numbers. And if your loyalty is still with the natural world, then you got to do what you got to do. Again, I think of this metaphor all the time that if space aliens came down from outer space, and they were systematically vacuuming the oceans and deforesting the planet and killing the grasslands and putting docks in every mother's breast milk, putting docks in every mother's breast milk. They, and even if they were able to buy off most of the population, some people would still fight back. Those would be the heroes. And that's the situation we're in. And those of us who care about the natural world need to stop it. And if other people don't like it, well, that's not where my loyalty is. My loyalty is with the polar bears, it's with the penguins, the hammerhead sharks. My loyalty is with the marble murelets. Direct democracy is not even what the United States has. I've never forgotten a letter to the editor I saw 30 years ago in the Spokane paper where a Mr. Smith wrote in to say that Direct democracy is the way that, that the United States works and that we have, we vote and majority always rules. And, I, and somebody wrote a letter to the editor right after that saying, no, that's not how it works because otherwise everybody not named Mr. Smith would all vote that everybody named Mr. Smith has to give every penny to everybody named not Mr. Smith. So you, even direct democracy doesn't guarantee anything because in that case, it would be unfair. It would be, as they talked about, as the founding father of the United States talked about, the tyranny of the majority. That's a possibility too. It doesn't matter because in this case, capitalism, civilization, patriarchy have all inculcated people into making the wrong decisions. And the question for me, is not direct democracy or not. The question for me is reality. And the question for me is, what do you want? And I want a world that has more wild salmon every year than the year before, that has more migratory songbirds every year than the year before, that has healthier oceans than every year than the year before. And it does not matter to my loyalty that most people in this culture don't want that by their actions. It only matters to me in terms of tactics and in terms of strategy and in terms of technically, given that's what we're up against, how do we protect the ocean? How do we make sure that there are more salmon tomorrow than today? The question is not what do most humans want? The question is, what makes a healthier and more secure and more vibrant and fecund and resilient 
natural world? That is the question. The reason I danced around this question is because it's not the right question. The right question is, what sort of world do you want and how are you going to get it?